Good morning. Today I'm going to talk about uh, anatomy of the lung bone and then I'm going to talk about the bones of the forelimb. As you know, bone have several functions. One of these functions is the protection. As we know that our heart, our brain are surrounded by the bones and these bones are responsible for the protection of these delicate organs. Uh, other function which is the site of the attachment for the muscle and the tendons. Every muscle, our body attached to one bone to another bone. So the bones is very important as a site for the attachment of the muscle. The other function is the house of the homobiotic tissue. As we know, inside the bone, we have the bone marrow. And this bone marrow is responsible for the protection of the red blood cells and the white blood cells. Also, the bone is the storehouse of the calcium and the phosphorus. Whenever our body needs calcium and phosphorus, there's a breakdown of the bones. Whenever there's increase in the calcium and phosphorus in the blood, there is a formation of the bone. Now we're going to talk about the classification of the bone. There's a cr three criteria for the classification of the bone. The first one depends on the location of the bone. The second one based on the shape and the last one based on the, on the ossification or the way that the, bo the bone is formed. So the first one based in location we have two type of bone. We have the axial skeleton and we have the appendicular skeleton. Based on the shape we have long, short, flat, sesamoid and we have the irregular. And based on the ossification how the bone is formed we have the endochondral ossification and we have the intramembranous so as I said, based on location, we have the axial and usually it's formed from around 80 bones and usually start from the skull. Then we have the vertebral columns and then we have the bony thorax. All of these structure with the sternum, we call it as the axial skeleton, whereas the thoracic girdle and the pelvic girdle with an attached limb we call it as the appendicular skeleton. So based on the shape, we have the axial skeleton and based uh, axial skeleton, which consists of the skull, vertebral column, and bony thorax. And we have the appendicular, which consists of the thoracic and pelvic girdle and the attached limb. So here we have the skull, we have the vertebral column, all of these structure with the bony thorax, which is include the ribs, and the sternum, all of these structures, we call it as the axial skeleton. Whereas the attached limb here, which consists of the thoracic girdle and pelvic girdle with the attached limb, we consider them as the appendicular. skeleton. Based on the shape, we have long, we have short, we have flat, we have irregular, and we have the sesamoid. For the long bone, the bones are longer than they are wide. See this bone here? This is the length of the bone and this is the width. So, so the bones are longer than they are wide. And usually the area here in the middle, we call it as the shaft or the body. In the second type, which is the short, you can see here, almost the shape of the bone is cube so we call it as a short bones all of these bones are considered as a short bone see the difference between here and here the bone they are longer than they are wide here almost the white and length almost equal see this one here this is the long bone whereas this one here all of these bones are considered as short bones then we have the flat bone the flat bone for example we have the skull we have the scapula these bones usually thin and flattened and usually curved and usually they contain roughly parallel compact bone surface with the layer spongy bone between them by this we mean this bone here like a compact bone and at the middle here between them we have a spongy bone I will talk later about the compact and spongy bone. Then we have the irregular bone. The irregular bone, they have various shape, don't fit to be long, short, 
are flat. For example, we have the vertebral column here. See this one? We could not consider it as long or short or flat bone. So this one here, this is the flat, and this one here, which is the irregular bone. Also, we have the last type, which is the sesamoid. See this one here? This is the patella, and we have the small bones here, which are called the sesamoid bone. And usually, these sesamoid bones, they are small, round, flat, associated with the tendons. Usually, tendons, which is the attachment, we have the muscle, and we have connective tissue that extend to the other bone, this connective tissue here considered as a tendon, and usually this structure, all of them associated with the tendon. Now we're going to talk about the anatomy of the long bone. For the anatomy of the long bone, the bone is divided into two regions. We have this area here, and we have this area here, and this area here. The area here that we found in the middle, we call it diaphysis. And usually this area, we have another name, which is the shaft or body, okay? This area here, the shaft or the diaphysis, okay? And the area that we have in the proximal and distal extremity, we call it the epiphysis. So the diaphysis is the area in the middle and that the area where we can hold the bone. And we have the proximal and distal extremity, which is the epiphysis. And then we have the epiphyseal cartilage. See this area here? And we should have another one here. Usually this structures consist of bones, but this structure here is composed of cartilage. And we call it the feces or the growth plate. And this part here is very important because it's responsible for the elongation of the bone to increase the length of the bone. When the animal or human reach to the level of the adult, this cartilage going to ossify and forms the bones. Instead to be cartilage, it replaced by the bone, and at this stage, there is no more elongation of the bone. When this happens, this structure here, which is found between the epiphysis and diaphysis, we call it as the metaphysis. We call it as the metaphysis. So the metaphysis is the joining point of the diaphysis and the epiphysis in the growing bones. And as I said, it's a replacement for the epiphyseal cartilage and it's replaced by the bones. Also, we have the bones here. We have the nutrient foramen. From this area here, blood vessels will enter through this area here and start to supply the bones. So from here came the name nutrient foramen. And usually we'll find several nutrient foramen in the bones. Also, we have this structure here. This structure, we call it as the periosteum. Periosteum is a connective tissue surrounding the bone, but it's not covering the proximal. This will not cover this area or this area, which is the area of the articular cartilage. And this structure, which is the periosteum, contain the osteogenic cells. These osteogenic cells is responsible for the uh, healing and uh, formation of a new bone. Also, we have another structure that found inside. We call it as endoosteum. Peri around and endo mean inside. And this also, this structure is consists of the osteogenic cells. And these osteogenic cells, if we have a fracture, these uh, cells, the osteogenic cells, is responsible for the formation of a new bone. And this is responsible for the healing of the bone.
Another structure we have, we have the articular surface, this area here. This is the articular surface. This one is the articular surface. This area where the bones, for example, this humerus articulate with the scapula. Um, from this area here, they articulate with the ulna. So this is called as the articular surface. Usually it's consists of hyaline cartilage. And at this area here, there is no periosteum very important we don't have periosteum at this area here in the articular surface there is no periosteum inside the bone here this cavity that found inside the bone we call it as the medullary cavity inside this medullary cavity we have the bone marrow which responsible for the formation of the red blood cells and the white blood cells now we have two important definition which is the compact bone and the spongy bone see this area here whereas the bone have no any spaces or cavities we call it compact bone where this area here where a lot of spaces almost like sponge we call it as spongy bone or the other name which is the cancellous bone see this one here this area where we don't have any spaces we call it as compact where at this area where we have a lot of these spaces we call it as the spongy bone so that this is the difference between the spongy bone and the compact bone usually the area of the diaphysis is consist of compact bone whereas the area of the proximal and distal extremity the epiphysis consists of spongy bone you see this area here There's the area of compact bone the epiphysis whereas this area here is composed of spongy bone this cavity inside this is the medullary cavity inside it we have the bone marrow which is responsible for the production of white blood cells or red blood cells based in the ossification we have two types of the ossification we have the intramembranous ossification and we have the endochondral ossification in the endochondral ossification usually we have a cartilage and this cartilage is going to be replaced by a bone and this we call it as the endochondral ossification whereas in the intramembranous ossification we have the mesenchymal cells and these mesenchymal cells going to differentiate into the osteogenic cells and start to form the bone so this is the difference between the two types intramembranous there is a direct replacement of a mesenchymal connective tissue into a bone whereas in the endochondral chondral mean cartilage replacement of the cartilage by bone and usually the intramembranous ossification occurs in the flat bone whereas in the most of the long bones we have we have the endochondral ossification as i said before we have axial and appendicular as i said the axial consists of the skull vertebral column and the bony thorax whereas the remaining part which is the thoracic girdle and pelvic girdle which is the scapula and the pelvic bone with the humerus radius ulna and carbon metacarbon and the phalanges and here we have the femur tibia and fibula tarsal metatarsal and phalanges they form the appendicular skeleton so the appendicular skeleton consists of the scapula humerus radius ulna carbon metacarbon and we have the phalanges okay also we have the clavicles and coracoid i will talk about them later in the hind limb we have the pelvic limb and also we have the attached limb so again in the horse this is the area of the skull vertebral column the bony thorax all of these structures are the axia whereas the scapula humerus radius ulna and the distal part of the limb the pelvic all of these structures are considered as the appendicular skeleton the same thing in the door uh, 
skull, vertebral column, bony thorax, axial, whereas the forelimb and the hind limb are considered as the appendicular skeleton. We'll start with the first part of the appendicular, which is the bones of the forelimb. As I said, it consists of scapula, we have the humerus, radius ulna, and we have the carpal, metacarpal, and phalanges. In human, we have two bones, which is the coracoid and clavicles. The coracoids in domestic mammals is reduced to cylindrical process, coracoid process fused to the medial side of the scapula. This is the scapula, and you see this structure here? This is the coracoid process. It's reduced. It's not as big as found in other animal species, but in the domestic animal, it's reduced to only this cylindrical structure. And it's found in the medial surface of the scapula. For the clavicle, it's either absent or small rudiment embedded in the brachiocephalic muscle in contrast to the well-developed functional bone of the uh, of man okay this bone in man it's well developed and it's connected between the sternum and the scapula however in different animal species this bone even is absent completely disappear or we have a remnant of this bone so in cat see this one this is the flat care bone it's about two to five centimeter in length in dogs it's only one centimeter in length with no connection to the skeleton. There's no any connection with the skeleton. In man, as I said, between the sternum and the scapula. And usually it found at this area here. And this area here is called clavicular intersection because at this area here we have the remnant of the clavicle. Now we'll talk about the scapula. The scapula is triangular in shape. It has three angles, three borders. For example, we have here, we have the cranial angle, we have the caudal angle, and ventrally, we have the ventral angles. Also, at this area here, we have the cranial border, we have the caudal border, and we have the dorsal borders. So we have three angles, and we have three borders. We have a cranial border, this one here. We have the caudal border, and we have the dorsal border. And we have three angles. This is the angle number one, which is the cranial angle. We have caudal angle, and the one that found in the ventral portion, this is the ventral angle. For the scapula, it has two surfaces. We have the lateral surface and we have the medial surface usually whenever we have a sharp edges these sharp edges should be found in the lateral surface as protection for the muscle for the friction and injury in the medial surface we can see the surface almost smooth so we have three borders cranial and caudal and dorsal border we have three angles we have cranial caudal and ventral we have two surfaces. We have the lateral surface and we have the medial surfaces. We have also three fossae. We have the supraspinous fossa and we have the infraspinous fossa and we have the subscapular fossa. This is the spine. The area above we call it supra and the area below we call it infra. Okay. And the surface that, or the fossa that found in the medial surface, we call it as the subscapular fossa. Always put in your mind that the sharp edges are found in the lateral surface. This is the scapular spine. And you see this area here, this is the supraglenoid tubercle. The orientation is cranially, so this is the area of the head, so this one is the cranial, so that's why I said before, this is the cranial border, and this is the caudal border, and this is the dorsal border. 
Also, I said this is the spine of the scapula, the area here, the supraspinous fossa, and here in the infraspinous. And you see here, this is the distal portion. This is the distal portion from the scapular spine, which is the acromion. So again, this is the spine of that scapula. This is the supraglenoid tubercle. So this is the area of the cranial border. This is the caudal, and this is the dorsal. And this is the lateral, and this is the medial. Again, this area here, we call it as the scapular notch. If we look at this one here, this is the spine. And this is the supraglenoid tubercle. So this one here will be the cranial border, and this one here will be the caudal border. This area will be the infraspin uh, supraspinous fossa, and the area here, this is the infraspinous fossa. So again, this is the spine, this is the cranial, and this is the caudal border. This is the supraspinous fossa and this area here, the infraspinous fossa. Again here, we have the spine and this is the supraspinous and the infraspinous. And this area here, the supraglenoid tubercle. And this is very important because this one here, the supraglenoid tubercle can help us to determine which one is the cranial, which one is the caudal border. So we can understand from this one here, this is the cranial border of the scapula and this area here will be the caudal border and this area here of the dorsal border and here this is the cranial angle and this is the ventral angle so it's very important to differentiate between lateral and medial and to differentiate between cranial and caudal borders because once you can uh, once you determine these lateral and medial and cranial from caudal it will be easier to differentiate whether this scapula is the right side or from the left side. Also, you can differentiate where is the cranial border, where is the caudal border, which is the cranial angle, where is the vent, uh, caudal angles. So again, this is the scapula. Okay, this is a supraglenoid tubercle. So this one here, this is the cranial border, and here we have the caudal. This is the cranial angle, caudal angle, and here we have the ventral angle. The area just below here, which articulate with the head of the humerus, this area is called the glenoid cavity, and the area here we call the supraglenoid tubercle, and the area below here we call it the infraglenoid tubercle. In the medial of the supraglenoid, we have this structure here, which is the crocoid protect. The second bone we have, which is the humerus, the humerus is consist of the shaft or body and or diaphysis, and we have proximal and we have the distal extremity. This area here, this is the area of the head, and usually it faces caudally. And in the proximal part, we have the greater tubercle, and we have the lesser tubercle, and we have the third tubercle, and we have the deltoid tuberosity. In the ventral portion, we have the two condyle, one and two, and the area above them, we have the area of the ibi condyle, ibi above. So we have the condyle, and the area above the condyle, we call it the ibi condyle. So this one here, again, we have the area of the humerus and the head, as I said, face caudally. And this head is going to articulate with the glenoid cavity of the scapula. See this one here? This is the head. And we have here the proximal part, which we have the head, we have the greater tubercle, the lesser tubercle. And in the ventral portion, we have the condyle lateral and medial condyle and also this structure here we have the medial and we have the lateral heavy condyle which will be found at this area here so this is the humerus of the horse again we have the head which is faces caudally the direction is caudally and then we have the greater tubercles and we have the lesser tubercles we have the deltoid tuberosity and we have the condyle the lateral condyle 
and we have the media condyle and the area just above here we have the lateral epicondyle and medial epicondyle see this one here this is the area of the scapula and this is the spine and you can see here this is the area of articulation and the formation of the joint which is the shoulder joint between the scapula and the humerus and this is the head and this is the area of the glenoid cavity you can understand from this area here we have the scapular notch and we have the supraglenoid tubercle the third and fourth bone we have which is the ulna and radius this is the area the one that found the cranially this is the radius and this one here this is the ulna that found in the caudal portion we have two bones and this is the area where we have the radius or ulna we call it as the forearm and the usually the proximal extremity of the ulna will be medial to the radius and the distal extremity of the ulna will be lateral to the radius by this i mean these two bones like coming like this way in the proximal part we have the proximal of the ulna will be medial to the radius whereas in the distal extremity will be lateral to the radius that's what I mean by this they come like an oblique they are not straight bones again for the ulna it consists of proximal end we have shaft and we have the distal end we have the proximal middle and distal and similar to the radius we have proximal and we have the body and we have the distal portion in the ulna this area here we call it as the olecranon process and we have This is the allocranial process, and this area here we call it as the trochlear notch. Again, in this picture here, we have the ulna, and here we have the radius, and the distal portion of the ulna or radius, we call them as the styloid process. See this one here, and this one here. See this one here. Again, this is the radius, and this is the ulna. And this is the trochlear notch, and this is the olecranon tubercle. Again, this is the ulna, and this is the radius. In dogs and pigs and humans, the radius and ulna, they are two separate bones. However, in the ox and horses, okay, or equine, usually the radius and the ulna, they are fused to the radius and it's very difficult to separate them okay you can see here this is the uh, ulna and this is the radius as you can see it will be difficult to separate these two bones from each other however in dogs and pigs we can see that there are two separate bones and there is a space between them which is the interosseous space again here we have the ulna we have the radius you can see this structure here which is part from the uh, ulna which is the anconial process after that we have the carval bones these carval bones we have seven carval bones they arrange into two regular rows we have the proximal row and we have the distal row in the proximal row we have these two bones fused together which is the intermediate radial carval bone then we have this one here which is the ulnar and the one articulate with the ulnar will be the accessory so this bone arrange into two regular rows this is proximal row and we have the distal row in the proximal we have two bones fused together which is the intermediate radial carval and we have the ulnar and the one that articulate with the ulnar will be the accessory in the distal row we have the first second third and fourth carbon bones there are some differences between animal species 
like for example in the dog we have the intermediate fuse then we have the ulnar and the accessory and we have first second third and fourth in the pigs we have eight the intermediate a radial they are separated and we have the ulnar carbon and the accessory then we have first second third and fourth in the ox we have the radial intermediate we have the ulnar and we have the accessory carbal bone however number one is absent the second and the third they are fused and we have number four in the horse we have the radial intermediate we have the ulnar and we have the accessory carbal bone however number one sometimes could be absent or sometimes be rudimentary very small and we have the second third and fourth so in the horse range from seven to eight depend if we have the first one is present or absent after that we have the metacarbal bone usually the number of the metacarbal bone is five but also there's a differences between different animal species for example in the dog this is number one two three four five however in the pigs for example number one is absent here's number two three four and five and you can see here that number three and number four is the only one reached to the ground we call them as the weight bearing however in the ox number one and number two is absent we have number three and number four fused together and here we have number five is a small bone usually this fused third and fourth bones in the ox we call them as the cannon bone we call them as the cannon bone however in the horse you can see here number one and number five is absent number two and number four they are small bone and we have the biggest will be the third metacarbal bone this third metacarbal bone we call it as the cannon bone and number two and number four we call them as the split or splint bone so you can see here in the dog we have five in the pigs we have four only three and four reach the ground weight bearing two and five we call them non-weight bearing in the ox the third and the fourth fused together and the fifth is reduced first and second metacarbal is absent in the horse number one and number five is absent we have the second and fourth they are small bone and we have the biggest which is will be the metacarbal and these third metacarbal in the horse we call it as the cannon bone number two and number four in the horse we call them as a split or splint bone in the ox the third and fourth they are fused together and we call them as the cannon bone so these are the carbon and this is the metacarbon so very important to understand this figure to understand the differences between the different animal species for the phalanges we have total 14 in the first finger we have only two we have the proximal and we have the distal and here's the first metacarbon in the others we have three Phalanges, we have proximal phalanx, middle, and we have distal phalanx. So that would give us the total is 14 because number one only have proximal and distal. See this image here, we have this image here, we have the metacarbal bones. This is the first and this is the fifth. And this one here, we have the carbal bone. See this one here, we have the proximal and distal here, proximal, middle, distal, proximal, middle, distal, proximal, middle, distal. All of these forms the phalanges. See this one here, three, 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 three. And here we have only two. In the bigs, we have 12. Because we have here three, 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 because the first one is absent. In the ox, you only have six because number one, number two, metacarbal is absent, and number five is rudimentary. So we have six uh, phalanges proximal, 
middle and distal in the horse because only develop the third metacarbon only we have one digit and this digit contain three phalanges proxima middle and distal again in the horse we have the proximal middle and distal in the horse this proximal phalanges they call it as the long bastard the one found in the middle which is the middle phalanx they call it as the short bastard and the distal phalanx they call it as the coffin bone see this one here this is the proximal or middle and distal phalanx as i said the proximal the long bastard and the middle is the short bastard and the last one the distal phalanx is the coffin bone in the ox or ruminant okay this is the metacarpal the fuse the three and fourth metacarpal and this is the proximal middle and distal phalanx see this one here this is one proximal middle and this one here is the distal phalanx again this image here this is the metacarpal proximal phalanx middle phalanx and we have the distal phalanx